Okay, you want me to say something soulful? Yeah. Drugs. I'm a junkie, and I love shooting up, and I'm, and that, that means I'm self-destructive, and you know, is that good enough? <laughs> it can be dangerous to achieve your dreams when you've spent your whole life in the pursuit of one goal. What happens when it's finally in your grasp, yet it still doesn't fulfill you? Like a dog chasing cars, what do you do when you finally catch one? In 1996, John Frusciante was all alone, cooped up in his L.A. house. His teeth were rotting, he was thin as a rail, his skin was littered with abscesses, and his hair was shorn to his skull. John was aware of what drug addiction had done to his physical appearance, telling concerned people during his rare human interactions, I don't care if I live or die. But the former Red Hot Chili Peppers guitarist wasn't in the state because of failure. In fact, it was the opposite. He had achieved everything he ever wanted, yet he still felt empty inside. It messed with John's head, and so he dove headfirst into the one thing he knew made him happy, drugs. And here it is. Da -da 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 -da. It was 1992, in the quiet lull of hotel rooms on tour, where the voices in John's head began to speak too loudly to ignore. On paper, it should have been the best year of his life. He was four years into playing guitar for his favorite band, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and they weren't just on the heels of releasing the biggest album in the band's history, but one of the biggest albums in the world at the time, Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Ever since he was a kid, John knew he wanted to be a musician, However, it was becoming all too apparent that music now only played a minor role in the rock and roll circus of his day-to-day -day life. The excesses of rock stardom wasn't all it was cracked up to be, and he felt like a performing monkey with the promotion and show business side of being a best-selling band. One day into their tour of Japan, May 7th, 1992, John announced he was leaving the Chili Peppers. He was only 22 years old. Everything he had previously built up as his life's goals had now betrayed him. To get a glimpse into the mindset of a man who had just departed one of the world's most successful rock bands, you need only to listen to the music on John's first solo album, 1994's Neandra Ledez, and usually just a t-shirt. John wrote the first half of the album during the recording of Blood Sugar Sex Magic, while the second half, all of the untitled, came just before he left the Chili Peppers. Recorded on a four-track tape recorder, the album's avant-garde stream of consciousness style reflects the decline of his mental state. He later told Us Magazine, my recordings had gone from these happy, optimistic things to celebrations of the surreal to really scattered, demonic-sounding things, like the sound of someone whose mind was about to explode. At the time, John claimed to have 400 ghosts in his head telling him what to do. But this wasn't the first time he sought out the supernatural to aid him in his artistic vision. He says he can hear them on the Blood Sugar Sex Magic recording, too. And I'd always say to people when we were playing it for them, we were recording them, I'd say, don't you hear those ghosts? Listen. And Flea would go, John, not, not everybody hears them. Now in this dark space, John would later say those ghosts turned evil to match his mental state. It's hard to discern the seemingly nonsensical lyrics and what they meant to John, but there were small glimpses of the bitterness he felt. popularity of his old band. Yeah! Flea was the closest one to John back when he was in the Chili Peppers and tried to remain friends with him, but John's drug abuse just became too much for him to handle. Anthony, on the other hand, who had dealt with his own drug addiction in the past, grew apart from John before his exit from the band and felt betrayed when he finally did leave. It would be five years before he spoke a single word to Frusciante. After nearly dying from an overdose in 1996, where his body at one point contained just one twelfth of the blood it was supposed to have, John was realizing he was running out of money. Desperate for cash to feed his addiction, he managed to scrape together enough raw demos for his second solo album, titled Smile From The Streets You Hold. A music video was made for the track Life's A Bath, depicting John's ritual of shooting heroin. But knowing deep inside the motives for the release, Smile from the streets you hold would give John no sense of pride or joy. So 
suddenly and without warning, the voices inside his head told him he would have to quit drugs or he would die. He said in a 1999 interview, I had a year of not feeling like myself, a year of feeling like I was an imposter who didn't deserve to even be called John Frusciante. I was smoking crack all day long, shooting heroin, shooting cocaine, drinking wine, taking Valium. I was this close to killing myself. But when I was going extremely fast in my head and feeling I was about to die, I would get these warnings from spirits saying, you don't want to die now. And so John made himself a deal that if he managed to get sober for 12 months straight and still felt the world was against him, he'd return to drugs and calmly wait for death. Coincidentally, this all came at a troubled time for the Red Hot Chili Peppers as well. Their experiment with new guitarist Dave Navarro was over, two years from the release of the disappointing One Hot Minute. Dave just didn't gel with the Chili Peppers, and they were looking for a replacement. Flea was one of the first people to visit John at a rehabilitation center he had checked himself into. It was just intended to be a friend visiting a friend, but the wheels started spinning in Flea's head about asking John back in the band. Afterwards, Flea approached Anthony and Chad about the idea, saying if they didn't at least approach John with the idea, he would leave the band too. Anthony and Chad were skeptical, but agreed. In the spring of 98, the four all reconvened to jam in Flea's garage for the first time in six years. It was an experiment, something they all knew could have been disastrous, but instantly the chemistry returned and the resentment evaporated. It didn't take long before they offered John the gig again, and he gladly accepted. John Frusciante's rehabilitation was slow and painful. He now had skin grafts to mask the countless abscess scars on his arm. He had all his teeth replaced. He had to relearn the instrument he had dedicated his old life to in the guitar. But it forced him into a new minimalist style on the instrument, and it's a major part of the sound on what would eventually be the Chili Peppers' best-selling record to date, Californication. Second chances are hard to come by in life. John hit absolute rock bottom where most people die. Luckily, John had people who truly loved him and believed in him when most people would slough him off as just another wasted rock and roll junkie. When money, fame, and rock stardom doesn't fulfill you, where do you turn? John freaked out when suddenly all his dreams came true in his early 20s. But what would make John one of the best guitarists of all time is that he experienced the darkness of drug-fueled isolation got a taste of the depths of hell. He learned from it and came out as a better person on the other side. 